How's it going, David? Hi, Nachiketa. I'm sure you've seen the video, or if you haven't, I hope you will see it soon, about the British Quran in Egypt. Yes, and um, it's a shocking story of the British involvement and the spread of the Quran and Islam in Egypt. Now, um, I'm going to send you a map, and in this map, what you will see is is um, the French and the Italians, um, well, the French territories, we'll focus on them today in Africa. And um, the nearest countries to France are Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. And then as you go further south, there is French West Africa. And um, this is uh, um, the, um, this is the colonial territory where the French were said to have ruled. Yes, in the from the 19th century, up until you know the mid 20th century so in some places a little after that so now when we see this map um uh, um we can see um you know the british are in egypt and the french are in west africa basically basically all that region you can see it so now what is strange is that if you have a look at the map of modern islam today and this is the muslim schools now the orange region is known as the maliki school uh, uh, and and the green region, Egypt, is known as the Hanafi school. Hanafi, yes, and the Maliki school, yes, is mysteriously in the region that was controlled by the French, French territory. Yes, this this seems uh, uh, very strange. So we're going to go through the history of this region known as the Maghreb or or West Africa, and the French Quran. Yes, the French Quran in Morocco and Algeria. It's a very shocking history. Um, for example, let me show you Casablanca. Here is a photograph of Mir Sultan a um, hundred years ago, more than a hundred years ago. And as you could see, there's a French man there, somebody from France took a, a photograph. Um, you know, this is in downtown Casablanca. What is there? Nothing, horse and buggy. <laughs> yes, well, today, if you go to Casablanca today and take a picture of Mir Sultan is downtown Casablanca. Yes. What do you see there today? I think this is a photograph from the 1960s or 70s or 80s. Um, what does it look like today? This same place, um, Cartier, Cartier, Mir Sultan. Cartier means the place of Mir Sultan, you know, the center of downtown Casablanca. What do you see the difference today? I see uh, buildings and apartments and um, you know, uh, sprawling uh, infrastructure. So w what can we say? Did Casablanca exist? Uh, it exists. Really? Uh, I mean, 100 years ago or 150 or 200 years ago. What no. would you say now? Did it realistically exist? So now Casablanca is a Muslim city in Morocco. Yes. And its population is today, um, um, they say, is up to about 5 million people. Within the city area, there's about 4 million people. And uh, um, yeah, Grand Casablanca in the, in the city area. And um, they say that um, if you go to the metropolitan area, it's about total, you know, with the suburban areas, about, about, about 7 million people. And, um, you know, there's migrants who live in shanty towns on the outside and people coming to work there. So uh, it's up to about 10 million people. But but the reality of Casablanca is it's a Muslim city and um, things like this, they're gonna say there's a lot of Muslim history there, Muslim museums and Muslim everything. But what do we know about the reality a hundred years ago? Is it there? No, nothing was there a hundred years ago. It's not there. So that means the history of this city must have been invented or falsified. So now let's have a look at Meknes. And here is the, I think this is Meknes, let's see. Here is the city of Meknes. And what is shocking, we see a similar thing. Yes, um, the city, uh, we can't really see it. It's like this, the new, new buildings today, Can you, uh, uh, new buildings at that time as if they've been just built. Can you see it? Yes. This is like um, 100 years ago. What do you exactly see in that city? 
I see a crowd of people, uh, kind of an open uh, um, street and uh, some walls. Uh, Do you think uh, they've been there for centuries? Do those buildings look old to you? No, they look uh, pretty new to me. Um, so the thing is, of course, they're going to tell us Meknes has got um, you know, thousand year history or something like this. But we can see that um, basically nothing there. The, the people have just arrived. And of course, there will be people trying to dispute it. Yeah, well, it's not a question of dispute. It's a question of proof. Prove it. You see? Question of, of um, you know, if you're going to declare something, then um, you should prove it. Don't you think so? Yes. Absolutely. And so if we look at Meknes today, it's very shocking. Um, here is, um, you know, you could see that last picture. And what do you see in Meknes today? Uh, it looks like a, a sprawling metropolis. You know, with a lot of buildings, lights. Yes. It's like it's an amazing place, beautiful place, thousands of people. It's probably got a population of, of around a million people. Yeah, um, and the Meknes Fez region, yes, um, has got about five million people in the region with Fez. Yes. And um, the city itself, the downtown area, um, it's got about half a million people. But um, we can't seem to find these people um, you know, 100 years ago, it's almost like they've just arrived. And um, so the thing is, um, let, let's have, have a look at the next city. Um, let's have a look at the city of Agadir in the south of Morocco. And the, I think this is from the 1920s or 30s, around then. There's older pictures, and you will find that um, it's the same thing. That um, What do you see in this place here, in Agadir, you know, um, 80, 90 years ago. Uh, I see uh, kind of an ocean front, a uh, few buildings, one uh, large street that's uh, right along the coast. But ah, quite yes. Empty. And, uh, yeah. And when the French arrived, there was nothing, nothing there. And they said there was a city there, you know, a thousand years ago or something. But um, today, this is what this place looks like now. What, what do you notice about the difference? Bigger streets, a lot more buildings, and um, yeah, it's a big, big city, sprawling metropolis. Yeah, it, it, in case um, some people are going to say, um, um, oh no, we can't see the waterfront properly in the previous picture. There's hundreds of pictures, yes, uh, that they could find of these places and other cities in the region. Here is a better look of that place. Can you see the same place 100 years ago? What do you see? I see a palm tree and a few buildings, uh, just very simple structure right there. One pier and... Um, what hut houses? Yeah. Yes. It's empty. Yeah. It's Not empty. Yeah. So now serious question is, where did these people come from? When did they arrive? Who brought them and why? And today, you know, Agadir Metropolis, yeah, has got about a million people. Downtown has got um, about half a million people. So it's a serious question. When did they come? And we are told that um, Morocco uh, is a historical country. Yes, um, with, a, with um, you know, thousands of years of history. And Islam, has got, they've got ancient manuscripts of the Quran, thousand years old, things like this. And um, the mud hut buildings that we saw before, you're looking at them from above here. You can see them directly in front of you. What do you see? What do they look like? How long have these people lived here in, if, it, if the buildings look like that? In fact, I'll send it to you a bit enlarged. Uh, I How mean, long all I, they I, I just see a very simple uh, structure, you know, made out of uh, stone and cobble and mud. And uh, I could not imagine it'd be uh, more than, I don't know, 10, 20 years uh, max. Yeah, it's, a, it's like they've just arrived. So something is wrong. Mm -hmm. So when did Morocco become Muslim? When did these people arrive there? So today we're going to go through, through these things. So now, the French ruled Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Mali, Mauritania, Chad, and all these places, all of West Africa, basically, apart, and the British, and they both, um, you know, worked together. Who controlled the education system in Morocco? You could read the first sentence of that. Uh, until 1962, the French colonial administration dominated education. Ah, the French controlled the education system? That's a little strange. You mean to tell me the French are controlling the education system in Morocco and the people have just arrived? 
and now they've got the Muslim Quran there and they've got Islam there and they've got a different school of thoughts compared to the others and it's called the Maliki school which just happens to be on French territory and then um, the people in power in um, M Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia yes, um, the elites and all these people where were they educated a hundred years ago? Yes, um, the French um, took people to educate them who were these people who wanted to, you know, set up countries like Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia? Who are the young Algerians a hundred years ago? Young Algerians, a group of French educated men who early in the 20th century became the first Algerians to attempt form within the colonial. Within the uh, colonial empire or system, obviously. Yes, so that's Algeria. Yes, so they were French educated, um, the elite or um, the people who the French trained. Now let's go next door to Tunisia. Who are the young Tunisians? Uh, let's see, uh, Tunisian National Movement in 1907, the Young Tunisians Party was formed by Bechir Safar, the party which consisted mainly of middle class French educated Tunisians. Ah, so now we, we can see the elite and the educated people in Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. Yes, um, and uh, uh, these are examples. People can check out the entire region. Yes, um, they can read the entire region and they can ask people. That's why I told people to go to the mosques and they can ask people and um, they will tell you, hey, um, those people, they, um, they were Arabs, the young Tunisians, young Algerians, mysteriously, that's what we call them today. And they were educated by the French. Yes, and these are the people in part today. Here is just an example of a private message somebody sent me from Algeria. It's because I ask people everywhere. And um, let's have a look. What does this person say about their village in Algeria? what people were doing 50, 60 years ago in Algeria. In my village in Nigeria, people weren't praying. They knew how to pray and the Quran and were Muslim. But the mosques were empty at the prayer times. It's the Muslims Brotherhood of Egypt. They came to finance mosques in every little village. They came in the villages and educated, educating them, calling them to fear Allah and go pray at the prayers time. This is one person that I know, but people can ask um, hundreds of people and they will get a, a similar story. They will find a similar story. And the Muslim Brotherhood, um, if people watch the video that I made with Raphael, um, it's called um, the British Quran in Egypt, then um, they will find more information about, uh, about this, about the Muslim Brotherhood, how they were trained by the British. They were trained by the British and um, people can um, uh, over there and they were taught Islam. They were taught the Arabic language. Yes. And um, people can find it. Here it is. Yeah. Um, if you want, you know, upload it on your channel too, then people could see the background to this and they could see it. this video. This is what they've got to find, the British Quran. Yes. And so these people came from there, from Egypt. Yes. Um, you know, after the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and they came and they're um, spreading Islam. So why were they doing this? And another thing is, many people don't know, but we'll go through it. Here is an example of the Qurans that were used widely in Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia in the 1990s, 1980s, in our century in the first 10 years now, many different printing. Um, but here is an example. If anybody could read it, they will find that there's differences. They will find that there's differences between these Qurans and um, things like this. And for example, it's like we're going to go through this in a minute. It's like there's a suspicious Quran called the Gold Quran, which is in Turkey. But um, before the 19th chapter, uh, all the chapters are missing. For the Gold Quran, read the first paragraph. Turkey has acknowledged that Johns Hopkins had no role in removal of the Gold Quran from the library in Istanbul or from Turkey, which occurred at an unknown time between inventories taken in 1756 and 1951. Turkey also acknowledges that Johns Hopkins has no knowledge of how the manuscript came to be in the United States. 
Ah, yes, it's just before 19 chapters that's in the United States, which is very suspicious. When we look at these manuscripts, the thing is not the oral Quran. The manuscripts, they've got um, differences, whoever wrote them. Like, for example, um, the Warsh, it says Alazina. In, in the, uh, um, this is in the, um, you know, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia Quran that was widespread printed, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And the Egyptian Quran widespread printed in the 1970s and 80s, it says Walazina. And here it says Alazina. And um, the thing is, um, what we see is that the Istanbul Gold Quran, which is the first 19 chapters before that, is in America. The Warsh Quran has the same spelling like the Turkish Quran. So the Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia Quran has a lot of similarities in spelling with the Turkish Quran, but the Egyptian ones totally different. Um, that's what um, many people have noticed. Now, what is very important is that Paris, so the French, have invaded Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia in the 19th century. And you could read this. What was Paris? Yeah, they're going to say it's in medieval Europe, but even in the 19th century, what did Paris become in the Paris. eyes of medieval Europe? Paris became, in the eyes of medieval Europe, a new Jerusalem. Yes, that's, that's simply it. Paris was the new Jerusalem or the city of Islam, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. It was the city of Salam or Islam. This is very important. So um, uh, I went, to, I explained more about this in, in the video of um, the British Quran in Egypt, that um, the French um, went to attack Moscow or the city of the mosque, but, the, uh, but um, the people weren't there. And then mysteriously, yes, in 1870, Paris just gets blown up. And the photographic evidence and many of these things are in that video and people can find it, 1870. And um, uh, the Central European forces, like the, the Germans and many others and their allies, they invaded and they just blew up Paris and the French cities. They, they must have been really angry. It was during the Napoleonic century, three Napoleons, Napoleon the first, second, third, etc. So now um, when we look through the history of the entire region, it's like um, it, it's, it's very strange that we can clearly see, um, you know, this French controlled territory. Yes, here is a map that shows it more and it shows the, um, the French color, you know, West Africa. That school is the Maliki school. Can you see it? Yes. Sunni Maliki, mm -hmm. and then the British territory, yes, in India and in Egypt, and what they occupied in the Levant, Pakistan, is the Hanafi school. Can you see it? Hanafi yes. and the mm -hmm. Malik, or maybe that's Malakai. Uh, it depends how you wish to pronounce it. And um, the strange thing is, you will see people commenting online everywhere, like uh, Moroccans, Algerians, and Tunisians themselves. You could read what people say of. Um, and um, for example, when did the rise of Islam happen in Morocco? It's in blue there. You could read it. As a result of a new stigma due to the occupation of the French and the rise of Islam in Morocco, this practice is now quickly disappearing. Islam started to spread and rise when the French arrived. Mm -hmm. Who was spreading Islam? Who gave the people Islam? Many of these cities are empty. I mean, they look, clearly look like just deserts. I mean, who the hell is going to be living in those deserts? There's no trees there. There's nothing there, no grass. There's no food, no vegetation. Where did the people come from? These are serious questions. If we can understand that, then we will understand where we came from. Because it's a serious question. In Europe, America, in the Far East, we are asking, where did we come from? How did we learn these languages? How did we get these religions? So many practices in the country that people would call pagan or other things disappeared mysteriously after the French arrived. Things like this, and um, you will see that there was something going on after the French arrived, that um, people are commenting, there's many blogs here. Um, you could just read first paragraph. When did, um, you know, um, many things that people did in Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, that are pre-Islamic, when did they die? When exactly did it die? These are Moroccans and Algerians talking. The first paragraph. When sure. exactly did it die? When exactly did it die in Morocco? People think Morocco was some secular beacon of progress in the 60s because 
they saw a picture of two upper class women in some university in a rich part of a major city wearing skirts that go down to the knees. The rest of Morocco was living in rural areas, still believing women getting an education was taboo. These tribes you glorify in these posts are also the ones that, to this day, still have the highest female illiteracy. Okay, now you could read the top line. When did Islam spread? There's uh, many people in Morocco, they're questioning and they're asking. So many people are saying, I think. Uh, I think in the 1980s and 90s with the Islamic revival that happened across the uh, MENA region. Yes. So the thing is, many people call it a revival. But the reality is we can't see these cities there. When did these people arrive? And um, uh, even today, half the people in the region, in many places, more than half, many of these people live in villages. And you can't uh, um, see no Islam in some of these places whatsoever. So many people can see that Islam was spreading. It started after, it started after the French arrival. And people are questioning, and um, many people quote official history. So, of course, they get diverted. Here is people who are saying, what do they say about Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia? These are uh, North African Arabs talking amongst themselves. What do they say? Uh, haven't we been Muslim majority for centuries? Mm -hmm. People are asking, have we been? Haven't we? Then it's strange. We can, um, there's all this culture that is nothing to do with the current Arabic language or the current Islam or the Quran. You can't find it. Then um, people are going to quote books and saying Islamic imperialism, Arabs came out of the desert. But if anybody watches, you know, the previous vi videos we did and other things, you could see Saudi Arabia was was um, half naked and they don't seem to have Islam either mm -hmm. and things like this. So they don't seem to have either uh, Islam either. And um, the Quran or this current uh, French uh, system. So now another thing is um, many of the people, it's like the colonial times. There was good people and bad people. Like, what did the bad people do, for example? Uh, as the French abducted and assaulted indigenous women with increasing frequency, tattoos became a talisman, a symbolic form of protection and... Well, basically, the French were, you know, raping people and the people who came with the French. It was a horrible time, what was going on in North Africa and West Africa for many people. But not everybody was bad. Um, not everybody was bad. There was things, um, what was going on. Um, some people would say there was progress. Um, it's like the cities were built. The French came with their expertise of construction and other things. And so the thing is, um, when we look at the people of that time, um, we will find um, many strange things. Like, for example, if the people weren't living in the cities, where were they living? This is an example of um, a middle-class family at that time. And they've got these clothes on, the white cotton, and you could see they're living in these like wigwam or tents that you would see Native American Indians living in, in America, similar buildings. They're, it's like they've just arrived, but the clothes were made in factories in France, in Spain, in um, Italy, and in Europe. You can see that the, um, the children have got no shoes on. There is no way they manufactured that machine cotton. It mm -hmm. was made somewhere else. Somebody gave it them. Yes, so the thing is, where did these people come from? When did they get their clothes? What are they doing in the desert? You could see it's a desert there. There's nothing there. Who the hell would go to live there? It's strange. So uh, by the 1950s and 60s, the people who were living in the cities, now the French and the Europeans built the cities, and then many of the natives came to live in the cities. And so what happened? The French failure? French failure to grant full civic and political rights to the Muslim elite would eventually provide a strong impetus for the decolonization movement. Okay, so we can see that the French are ruling these places. The French have given them education how the French wish to give them some of these people that they found in the villages. And um, where did these people come from? So the French have now educated these people. And um, after they educated them, they taught them Arabic, they taught them Islam and many of the things, many of these people, France didn't give them full equal rights at the time, not like people have equal rights in France today. So this is when they wanted independence, these things. Now, many of the, these people were chosen by the French anyway, 
Yes, and they were educated by the French. So the more we look at the region, we see that there is something wrong. So when we look at the region, um, it's like, for example, the French and the Jesuits, the Masons and other people, they came from Europe. They went to Lebanon, they went to Tunis, they went to Cairo. For example, what were the Jesuits doing? The Jesuits um, opened their universities and schools, not only in Tunisia or other places, but in other parts like Lebanon, Syria. And what did they do? Um, Phase that the Jesuits... Phase that the Jesuits not only chose Arabic as a language of communication, but educated in Syria. Well, you've generally got the message. The Mm -hmm. Jesuits were um, speaking in Arabic. Uh, um, Jesuits and the the people who came with them, colonial people and all these things. So why did they know Arabic already? There are Europeans who are going there and they're teaching people in the Middle East in the Arabic language. So here you could read more. It's well known. Yes. Uh, For example, yes, in Syria and in Lebanon, you could read this Jesuits and Catholics. Jesuits and Catholics Catholics were generally for the society's work in Syria and Lebanon, teach the French language. Catechism was, in fact, taught in Arabic. Ah, so you can see, that's in brackets. They taught French also, but um, they were teaching in Arabic. So these people spoke Arabic. You can see this, yes? So yes. these Jesuits speak Arabic, and they're teaching Uh, many of these native people, Arabic, and they're educating them in Arabic. So the question is, how can they teach in Arabic unless if they already knew this language? They must have known it. And it's like here is an example. I'm going to send a screenshot of an Algerian Quran. Um, People can check it themselves. And um, here, when you see in these manuscripts that were printed in Europe today, the machines um, made in Europe now print um, many of these Qurans in the local areas. But here you will see even the Allah system um, symbol. I mean, not the system, the way the symbol is done. It looks like a symbol. Who invented the, the symbol Allah? And then I put two things in a red circle to show an example of um, that they've actually added extra words and extra symbols, Arabic letters in a sentence. This is supposed to be Bismillah, Hi Rahman, Rahim, but it's written in this manuscript, Bismillah, Al Rahman, Al Rahim. It's like I'm um, compared to the oral Quran, it's a totally different word. Now, why would somebody change the words in the manuscripts? This is also in the Cairo Quran, not just the Tunis Quran or Algerian Quran. I mean, somebody has done this. So that when the oral Quran disappears, yes, people will be learning from these manuscripts. It's in the Arabic alphabet. If anybody asks an Arab, they will tell them, hey, um, you know, I can read it um, if they've learned the language. And um, the thing is, uh, there's extra symbols there. Who added them? Why? And why were the Jesuits and other people teaching in Arabic? And then if we went to Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Mali, Mauritania, Mauritania, Chad, Chad. And um, what do we know about the Arabic language? This is from a Muslim foundation, Hidayah Foundation. It used in the Quran and in the holy books of Islam. No one speaks classical Arabic as a native, nor is it used for conversation. Nobody speaks Arabic. So who took Arabic to this region and when? And uh, they don't speak it today. So why could these Europeans, such as the Jesuits, know how to speak Arabic 100 years ago? This shows that Arabic came from Europe. Even to this day, Moroccans, Algerians, Tunisians, they don't speak Arabic. They learn it in school. You see? You can see this. Yes? Yes. And isn't it suspicious? Would you not find it suspicious that the language that they don't speak but um, the Jesuits, and Mm -hmm. they can speak this language. Is this not absolutely suspicious? Very much. Highly suspicious. Yes. If they don't speak this language, of course, they don't know this alphabet. So the Jesuits are coming along, they're opening schools, and the Europeans and other people, and they're educating these people. What the hell is going on? Can somebody tell me, please? What do you think is going on? Is it suspicious? 
Well, my suspicion is that uh, uh, the language is introduced to the local population. There's kind of a displacement of, of the population and people uh, moved over somehow to the Northern Africa region and uh, the, the Jesuits and the different colonial uh, uh, governments uh, established um, the education system and the language. So that's uh, what my suspicion yes. will be. Yes, they did. And we're going to go through the proof. Yeah, and um, the thing is, if anybody wants to understand the masonry of the current Arabic alphabet, yes, the shapes and the designs, um, they were masonically designed. And um, this is in my books. Um, if anybody reads both of these books, um, Secrets of the Kabbalah and 33 Degrees, they will be able to see how they were um, designed. And of course, when you go to the region, they're going to say, A, Islam was revived and um, standard Arabic or classical Arabic. Well, has been lost for it. You could read this. Why don't Arabs speak standard Arabic anymore? No, standard Arabic is not anyone's native language. It, it, and it hasn't been it, uh, in at least a thousand years. Instead, Arabs speak one of many regional dialects. Yes. I'm guessing. Um, mm -hmm. For example, Egypt. Yeah. In many villages, um, you know, almost everybody. Um, in many many villages, um, people have different languages. It's it's shocking. It's, you um, you know they call them dialects, but actually there are languages in Egypt. You could find up to twenty five different languages minimum. Yes, uh, maybe even a hundred. And so, for example, Cairo University. Yes, a hundred years ago. This is very shocking. This is from Cairo University in in Wikipedia. And um, uh, when we check this out, it's very shocking. Yeah, problems. problems, you could read it yourself. Yes, uh, problems during this period also included a lack of professional facility or faculty to fulfill the founder's educational uh, vision. There were simply no Egyptians with doctoral degrees, the ability to teach in Arabic and a familiarity with Western literature in their fields with whom to fill professional posts. Thus, European oriental orientalists who lectured in classical Arabic filled many posts until the 1930s. The university also whoa, sent... Whoa, whoa, whoa. What was that? Uh, uh, um, what is that now? There were simply no Egyptians, no Egyptians with doctoral degrees or uh, Egyptians who had the ability to teach in Arabic. Uh, it, until the 1930s. Mm -hmm. Thus, European people, European Orientalists, give them a name, they've given them a name, Europeans lectured in classical Arabic and they filled many of the posts until the 1930s. This is just one institution. You will find a similar thing in many other places. And before then, yes, um, uh, and uh, those those local people who did have some of these jobs where did they learn it from? That you will see their teachers were Europeans. So we can see here, who is teaching these Egyptians in Cairo University? Classical Arabic, the language of the Quran. Who is teaching them this language? Europeans. Who? Uh, is it Chinese? Or is it Europeans? Or is Europeans. it um, African? Europeans? So where would, you, where would you say that this language came from? Africa or China? Europe. Yeah, yes. It's it's becoming a little clear that there's something wrong. Yes, and then um, before, so now many of these teachers were trained in Europe. Let's go to see Paris. Yes, and um, what what happened is that in Paris, people can check Institut National de Langue et Civilisation Orientale. For example, Wiet, um, Gaston Wiet. He was an assistant. Let's see, he was he, uh, as an assistant professor in Lyon, uh, where he taught Arabic and Turkish. Then a professor in Cairo. He was drafted in 1914, assigned to the Armée de Orient as a uh, second lieutenant. He ended the war with okay. the rank okay. of captain. Okay, okay. Now let's examine this. So these people, they, they're telling us this was the Institut National of languages and Eastern civilizations. And um, he was teaching people Arabic and Turkish in Paris. Then he was a professor in Cairo. 
But these people were military generals. So education, what we are thinking 100 years ago when we see institutes, Oxford University, these were colonial military centers. You see? Yes. Mm -hmm. So now the thing is, I mean, 1919, what did he do? Uh, 1919. Uh, in 1919, he assumed his uh, teaching activities in Lyon and Paris. In 1926, he was appointed director of the Museum of Islamic Art, a position he held until 1951. He wrote 14 of the 35 volumes of the catalog of the museum, of which he did much to enrich the collections, particularly in the areas of items of uh, furniture oh, okay. and epigraphy. So we will find the same things, not just in Cairo, um, not just, um, you know, in, um, in Europe and other places. We are going to find many of these museums of Islamic art and other places opened by the Europeans in Cairo, managed by the Europeans and many other things. And in Europe, in Europe, they had colleges and um, excellent centers that were teaching the Arabic language. People can check all these things. They were teaching Arabic and um, Persian Arabic, and they were teaching not just Persian Arabic, um, Turkish Ottoman Usmanli Arabic also. They were teaching this in Paris. Yes, this is very important to know. So this means that all of these versions of Arabic were already in Europe. For example, um, if we go to the university records, of course, they falsified it to make it look a bit older, but um, they're, they're teaching like in this Institut National de Langue et Civilisation Orientale in France. The, uh, what are they teaching? Um, discipline. You could go through the list. Persian language, Arabic, Turkish language, modern Greek, Arabic, Persian, Turkish, uh, Persian, Russian language. Yeah, these, uh, yeah, so, so um, the thing is, when they say Persian, this is the old Persian Arabic. They were also teaching this um, classical Arabic, that's the Arabic. And then the Turkish Ottoman Arabic, they're teaching this. Then they're teaching this Greek language, which mysteriously turned up, uh, um, you know, when uh, um, when Greek independence happened. Yes. And um, things like this, um, you know, we could see um, modern Greek. And it's like um, many people won't believe it, but they invented ancient Greece. Ancient Greece did not exist, unfortunately. And um, people can see the evidence of this in my book with the secret mathematical codes with 19 it's shocking about the 19 they must have used you know maybe computer technology to organize this 19 that ancient greece they totally invented it they were teaching this greek language so many of these languages were invented so they were teaching them in europe and mm -hmm. so how could they do that and unfortunately many people won't want to hear this you know i explained this in the video with Raphael that are many people they took to build fake monuments to build Cairo and all these other cities in the deserts in Egypt. They kidnapped them from um, Western Asia and India, even the Western Asians, before they were in Western Asia, like Yemen, Oman, they were already from India. They kidnapped them and like often, same like they kidnapped people and took them to work in the factories in New York and um, Philadelphia and in Chicago. Uh, and Boston, they were kidnapping them from Europe and Eastern Europe. So you could read this. Um, this is the reality of the story of um, like how many people came to, um, you know, Gaza, even in Palestine. After World War I, what were the British doing? The British ruled Egypt and then they took over Palestine from the uh, Ottoman Germans who were defeated. So in 1917, you could read there, the British. The British began to encourage the kidnapping of peasants to serve in their labor groups in Palestine. Thousands of fellahin were sent to Syria, Mesopotamia, and to France. Yes. So they came from this Egyptian, and many of them who ended up in France or in Europe, the gypsies. It's a long story. And those people, before they came from Egypt, came from India. So the arrival of the gypsies, Mesopotamia, places like Iraq. And people can check, um, just during World War I, after World War I, just in Iraq, the British took Iraq, Syria, and Kuwait. Um, the British took about half a million people. About half a, half a million people basically kidnapped um, thousands of these people who went and they intermarried with people who came from uh, Ottoman lands and from the fall of Moscow 200 years ago. 
people have to watch that other video and they will have to read many of my books to understand this further. Um, I forgot um, exactly how many they're going to say. Just to Iraq, they sent um, about, um, uh, they took about um, a third of a million Indian, and they called them servants in 1917, I think it was, or 1918. Um, I don't have the information in front of me. People will go, have to go and check it themselves. But anyway, they took many of them from there to Palestine, unfortunately. And at the same time, what happened is, something was going on in Europe. So in Tunisia, many Europeans went to live in Tunisia and many Europeans crossed the border to go live in Morocco in the 19th century. You could read where it says by the mid 19th century. By the mid 19th century, the Jews who originated in Tuscany or other parts of Italy and settled in Tunisia during the course of the century were allowed to... Okay, you basically got the message. Mm -hmm. There's many people, they call them Jews, but it's not Jews, but because they don't talk about this history, but many Tunisians will say that they migrated from Italy. Um, and they know that their grandparents can remember that their grandparents or their father um, were, was running from Italy. Something was going on, that nobody in Italy spoke Italian. So there was many people who were running from Italy going to Tunisia. Um, many people who they said Jews, but when they arrived over there, we don't seem to find any um, any Jewishness within them. So it's um, very strange. So now we're going to go a bit more to this um, to have a look at um, what is going on in Morocco, Algeria and Tunisia itself. And unfortunately, this is the reality. Tunisia was occupied in 1883 by the French. As, as many people from Europe are running over there. So they thought, hey, we're going to go over there. Now we're going to have to control the people. So many of these young Tunisians, yes, who wanted independence later, they were educated in France. The other thing, you could read the second paragraph. The party known as Young Tunisians was formed. Yes, uh, the party known as the Unis Tunisians, Young Tunisians, was reform, uh, formed in 1907, who thought that the people of Tunisia should have self-determination rather than being a factoriate of uh, France. The movement was inspired by the Young Turks of the Ottoman Empire and the Egyptian National Party led by Mustafa Kamil Pasha. They were French-educated and advocated for the rights of Tunisians and French men. In 1908, the party supported the establishment of a constitution for Tunisia. They printed a newspaper called Le Tunisien. This was the first French language Arab newspaper in Tunisia. Their motto was, okay. Yes, these people were trained in Europe. Yes, they were educated by the Europeans. They were printing newspapers or documents or whatever with the machines that the French gave them. They didn't have these machines and other things. So it's very strange what is actually going on. And mm -hmm. um, the thing is, we will go through a few more details of um, what is actually going on. What did the French actually do while they were um, while they were there in Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia? What did they do for these people to turn around and think, "Hey, that we want to um, we want independence." Mm -hmm. So now the thing is, throughout the region, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia and um, Western Libya, you could read this. Yeah, madrasas means Islamic schools, madrasas. Right. Madrasas in Morocco were funded entirely by private charitable endowments. The larger endowments were then taken over by the proletariat government. Yeah, by the French. So now what they are telling you is that there was all these Muslim madrasas there and the French took them over. Like uh, here is Agadir, and they're going to say the French went there and they took over the Muslim madrasas. Now, I want you to tell me how many Muslim madrasas were there here? Probably. Can you see like, any? No, I don't know. I don't think so. Hey, oh, the place is empty. I sent you another picture, which yeah. is totally clear and it shows the place is empty. Yes, not just this one, there's many more. Um, mm -hmm. This picture is probably 1920s. 20s or before then. You, so here is Casablanca. So now if you go there today, you would believe the French took over 
these Muslim Quranic schools called madrasas where they learn the Quran. Yeah, so here is Casablanca. Have a look there. Did the French take over any madrasas in Casablanca? Uh, no, not there. Do you see any madrasas? There's nothing there. There's a, a guy and, and a buggy. What, what happened to these madrasas? Where have they mysteriously disappeared to? Are you trying to tell me they disappeared? Yeah, here is a picture of Meknes. And uh, Meknes, I think, around um, 1900. So mm -hmm. if the French arrived, at, let's say, in the 1870s and 80s, how many of these madrasas can you see there? Zero. Yes, the people have just arrived. So now here we're going to go to the shocking history of Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia itself. Now here is the real deal. And yet you can read this. In 1850. In 1850, the French colonial administration also began to set up uh, Franco-Arab universities in Algiers. Constantine and Pelimken were where both the French language, science, and Islamic doctrine and law were taught, free of charge. Only people who had been educated in the Franco-Arab madrasas could be selected for the different officially recognized Islamic religious functions, such as mufti, imam, and muzin. The colonial administration not only sought to control the nomination of Muslim religious personnel, it also controlled the sermons in the official mosques. In addition, the French looked for support from selected Sufi orders and confraternities. Uh, those who agreed to cooperate were given authority and privileges, including, for example, a sponsored pilgrimage to Mecca. The French also became involved in the upkeep of mosques, though in a very unforthcoming way between 1830 and 1860, Five new mosques were built in Algerian cities, which was far from being sufficient to compensate for the mosques that had been destroyed during the French conquests. Based on the inventory of the total mosques in French, uh, decided to uh, classify only 78 mosques as buildings that deserve to be preserved, uh, whereas 1494 mosques were left to be worshippers. To maintain. Okay, so now the thing is, we can smell the lies in history that many of these cities can you see? Did they even exist? No. 150 years. No. So there's no cities there. If there is no cities there, yes. Um, so now in downtown Casablanca, I challenge anybody. Bring me your proof. How many mosques are there here? How many mosques can you see there? Zero. I just want you to tell me. Zero. Zero. No mosque. I don't believe you. I don't believe you. I'm an Islamist. I'm a Quranist. I don't believe you. There's ancient Qurans here. There's ancient Quran manuscripts here. The, hmm. the Muslims have been memorizing the Quran for centuries here. Can't you see there's mosques there? Can't you see? Look carefully in the picture. Mm -hmm. The people are invisible. So now uh, many people are saying, hey, they're putting comments, hey, the Quran, Quran. It's like when I showed in my books, that um, the Hebrew language was invented, it didn't exist, the mm -hmm. current Hebrew language. And it, it was invented, yes, many Muslims um, were actually celebrating me. They were celebrating me. Um, you, they could read about this in my book, Jerusalem is in Europe, and other things, that, the forgery of, um, you know, and the invention of um, Christian holy sites, and the forgery of Jerusalem, Jerusalem's in Europe, the biblical Jerusalem. And um, many people supported me, yes, um, especially Muslim people, because they didn't see it as a danger to, to the brainwashing or the lies in history that they've been brought up with, or in my book, The Last Crusade. Um, people could read that. There's a lot more information there. And in Skulls and Bones, it goes through a lot of the things that happened of the forgeries in Christianity, and these church buildings were not churches. The church buildings were not churches. But now that um, I'm talking about Islam, even you, many people have harassed you, saying in many things, uh, almost like as if we're attacking um, the religion. This is not about religion. This is about history. And the thing is, they're telling us that um, the French destroyed original mosques. Many of these cities, we've only shown a few examples. Many of these cities were not even there. 
they were not even there. So they couldn't have destroyed anything. It didn't even exist. So now let's look at the reality. The French opened up these um, universities to teach Arabic. That's why they're called Franco-Arabic, but um, it, because the French opened them. Yes, in Algiers, in Constantine, in Tlemcen. And uh, they taught French also. The, these universities and schools are doing the same thing. And they were teaching Islamic doctrine and Islamic law. You know what the Quran says? It was basic Islam at the time. They just opened up. Yeah. And they were teaching it free, free, you know, trying to bring people in. Mm -hmm. And so these people who were taught in the Franco-Arab madrasas, yeah, they basically opened these madrasas. Um, these people, then when they taught these people Arabic, they're teaching them Arabic. They're teaching them how to memorize this Quran. They brought this Quran. They brought this Arabic language. Nobody to this day, even now, they can't speak this Arabic language. They're still learning in these same schools because when they became independent, today it's called Algerian school and the buildings have been modernized and updated. So the French trained these people to become muftis, imams, and other people. You see? Mm -hmm. So they selected everything. They built the mosques. And they're going to say, ah, yeah, there was mosques here before. Now they're going to say that there was Sufis or Bektash in Turkish. Yes, Bektash societies and other things. Now that's a totally different matter. Um, that's a totally different thing. But another thing is, you know, especially after the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, the French were paying for people free to go to Mecca and Medina. Yes, to go to Hajj over there. And the French maintained the mosques, they financed them all. And so the 1830s to the 1860s was the beginning, five new mosques. Or before then, we can't seem to realistically find anything else. They were building mosques, they were training people to learn Arabic, and they were teaching them the Quran. And the local people, they'll tell you everywhere, we couldn't speak Arabic or anything and um, things like this. That um, if you go to Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, it's the same thing. Mali, Mauritania, Chad. And what they will say is that even today, you could read it yourself. Even today, about half of the population speaks Berber still. Moroccan Dar Ija is basically the format of the Berber languages with mainly Arabic. But also French. They claim it's got a mixture of Arabic, yes. So um, that's why up to about half of the meaning meanings i've said this before yes of the arabic quran have now got mixed together with these dialects and these dictionaries but what we can see is that the french are coming over yes i'm teaching them and um, if people are going to imagine these schools they're imagining something modern believe me it's not something modern or anything that um, people can imagine in fact let's go through a few of these schools and we'll have a look at them. Like, for example, here is a jewel, what they call Franco-Arab school in um, Al Jadida. I think they were teaching them Judaism there. You could read it at the bottom um, in because they call it Franco-Arab and people are imagining a school. So what is this? Ecole Arab? Uh, I cannot read it. Ecole Arab Francais. Arab okay. Francais. Mm -hmm. At the bottom. Uh, um, you know, professor, uh, elève de école arabe française. That's what it means by Franco-Arab. These wow. pictures are describing these. So when somebody reads it, they're going to think it's something professional, Franco-Arab school. No, these pictures show the reality. It's like it's just, this is a photograph from 1912. And you could see the teacher there, or uh, if it's a Jewish school, it would be like um, a rabbi. Yes, and it would be an imam. But these people were trained by the French. And so the reality is, this is what these schools were like. Now, it's not just there. The Europeans opened similar schools everywhere. Yes, so um, this one is in Al Jadida. It's Franco-Arabic school. And um, if people want to know more details about the school, some people have written about it. You know, uh, many people like, for example, in January 1907, Al Jadida port became under Fr French control. The Franco-Arabic school was open there. They're teaching Arabic there. And um, the thing is, when you look at these teachers, you could see they're not exactly really teachers. And similar schools, the Europeans opened up in other sides of the world. Like um, here, you will see this is supposed to be um, Siwan Mission Day School in Bihar in India. Yes, and um, you will see on the right-hand side, and um, they're teaching them, yes, um, you know, 
in some schools they're teaching Christianity, some they're teaching um, Hinduism, some they're teaching um, you know Islam, and you will see, yeah, they've got a uh, mosque huts there, but it's a missionary school, yeah, and um, other things they've got mosque huts, and you can see the European um, and colonial teachers there. Yes, you could see it. So now I'm going to show an example of a Franco-Arab school. Yes, here is another one 100 years ago in Morocco, in Mazagan. Yes, and um, you could see there's a, one of the local Arabs, maybe he's Jewish or maybe he's Muslim, I forgot which this school is itself. And um, the French trained these teachers and then that's what they did. They educated these people. So it looks like somebody's going to turn around and say, and um, you could see the European teacher is, uh, or the colonial master is standing there and he's making sure that, um, you know, the person who they trained is now training these young children. And mm -hmm. these young children and all these other people, they're living in houses like this, that mm -hmm. you could see that there was no schools or anything before the Europeans came. They're wearing the white cloth that was made in European machines. Yes. And, um, you know, here is uh, more pictures that you could see. How are they living, still living like this in the jungles of the Amazon or in, um, you know, um, what we call dark Africa, you know, in the, in the jungles and swamps of Africa? Can you see these primitive buildings? And they've got white cloths on. And many of these people have got some clothes on because the Europeans gave them clothes. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, the thing is, you know, the Europeans gave them clothes. So many people will imagine there was a big city there, Al Jadida. Al Jadida is a star port. And you could see what it looks like at the time. And here, um, you know, you will see what it looks like today. So where did these people come from? Why did they need education? Why did the Europeans open up these Arabic schools so that they could learn Arabic? You can't know the Quran without this Arabic. They taught them the oral Quran with the oral original meanings. Then the dictionaries were updated and modified. Um, mm -hmm. um, in other sides of the world, like Lebanon by the Freemasons and the American University in Beirut. But let's have a look at this picture. Here is a Franco-Arabic school in Mesheria. And um, what you could see is if you look carefully at this picture, that you will see that people came from many different backgrounds. They even brought people from India to Morocco, mm -hmm. Algeria, Tunisia. And, they brought, and, the, and the British tr tried to stop, the French tried to stop, black Africans from going north. Yes, they tried to stop this, but um, many of them went because of the French army and they interbred. But look carefully, you will see white European children there, as well as Indians, the mixed race, and you could clearly see the European teacher there and all these things, and they're wearing the white cloth that was made in European machines. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just there. Here you will see. So over there, they're teaching them Arabic. Now here in Madras, they're teaching them in India. They're teaching the Madrasi language, which is very beautiful. Um, and you can see they've all got the same white cloths. And um, you'll see some Hindu people there and Christian people there. But they basically brought these peasants and everybody and they're giving them an education. So you can see this, um, you know, that's in Madras. Here is another place. It, you have to compare it worldwide. You cannot just judge from one place. Here is in Ranchi. And these people, of course, they taught them Christianity. They taught them the local dialects and the languages, many Jesuit fathers and other things and Protestant fathers. It doesn't matter which one. The empires took them, took these Europeans. And today those people are called the Christians of India. But they're going to tell us Indians have been Christians for centuries, which is just a scam. And um, here you will see Malabar in India. Same like they're saying these people um, in the Middle East have been uh, following this type of Islam for centuries. Here is in Malabar. And um, these people, they baptize them, as you could see. Um, there's um, Europeans there and they were teaching them. And the Europeans built that building. These people had no idea. And now here we're going to go through the shocking part. The shocking part. The Europeans took so many photographs in Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. Here is, um, you could read it, under Algeria Cartes Postal Ancients. What is this picture? Un école Quranic. Yes, école, un école Quranic. This is a Quranic school mm -hmm. in 1905, in Jazair, in Algeria. In Jazair. Jazair mm -hmm. is, is um, how it's pronounced. And you've got the Europeans. They've gone there. 
and they've opened these Quranic schools. Soon we will have a look at the faces of these teachers, and many of these teachers are people who they taught themselves. First, they taught them in the cities in Constanza, Algiers, and in Tlemcen. They, uh, um, they opened these centers, and then those um, people who became teachers, they sent them out to all the villages. And um, the thing is, so what they did is um, they sent these people, and these are now the Quranic schools the, of how to memorize the Quran, and they're taught the original meanings of the Quran, the oral Quran. And they're being taught standard Arabic, like A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Now, in Arabic, it goes, Alif, Ba, Ta, Sa, Jim, Ha, Ka. Yes. So what they did is they opened these schools, madrasas. And in Slumsen, here is the one that the Franco-Arabic school, where they're teaching them Arabic and these other things. Here is, it says madrasa, madrasa. And um, you could read it. Des élèves in French. Des élèves de la madrasa de Timpsien au début Slemsen. du... Lemsen, our debut, do. Okay, it's difficult. It's difficult. Yes. But basically, here is the madrasa of Tlemcen, the Franco Arabic school that the French opened, um, you know, in the beginning of the 20th century. And they brought these people, and you can see these people are in rags, and they're slowly training them in Arabic and in the Quran. Now, those people, uh, this is a city, and um, the French um, opened it, and um, those students, when they grow up, they went out to the villages. The French sent them out to go and teach the village people Arabic and the Quran. Now, wh when we when we look at how the, many of the local people lived, many of them were actually naked. You could find the naked pictures online. I'm not posting them here. And many of them, they came from India after the Suez Canal. The French brought them for construction of these um, staff or cities like Algiers and Oran. But this is how the people live. As you can see, they clearly cannot read and write. And um, the white cloth they've got there was made in machines. And so soon we will see that slowly these people, they learned how to pray. Somebody taught them how to pray. Somebody taught them the Arabic. So now let's go through. And um, I will read the next one because it's actually difficult. But have a look at this picture. You will see th these are like the Jesuit sisters or the European teachers. They're called the white sisters that the Europeans sent. And here is... A school for girls in Kabili. And um, what they did is, you can see the people are half naked. The French gave them the rags and the clothes, and um, they don't have shoes. But um, here is, I actually read the first paragraph, Dans les cartes. Um, for the, for, uh, uh, the first paragraph, or people will say, I'm making this up. You can see the, the white European ladies who are there. And what are they doing? Just read the first um, paragraph. Dans les cartes represent uh, école, école. Uh, Quranic at uh, Madrasate News. That's okay. Yes. Okay. That's, a, that's simple. So when the Europeans did this, they took photographic evidence. You are going to find hundreds of photos all over the world. Dans le carte means in this picture, basically in this card, represents, it shows the Quranic school, Madrasa. And um, who is teaching them there? Who, who who are the teachers in this Quranic Madrasa school? Is it is it the great Arabic priests or who do we see there? The Jesuit sisters? I call them that. The, the white sirs, sirs blanche. Who yes. do we see there? The Europeans teaching them the Quran and um, the Arabic language or do we see Chinese teaching them? European Jesuit yes. nuns. And even to this day, these people still haven't learned these languages, uh, um, Arabic. But they memorized the Quran and they memorized the basic meaning. So those people who came first from Europe gave them these original meanings before these dictionaries spread. Of course, they took pictures in a nice way so that they could send them back to Paris. Yes, here they've got the students half naked with no shoes. Here is um, a European father, a white father in Kabili. And you could read the first line. Hey, Kabili. Un class de Arab a la mission de Paris Blanc. Okay, here is un class d'Arab a la mission de Paris Blanc. Yes, the Kabili are a group of local people. They call them Arabs today, or they call them Berber sometimes, or they call them Algerians or sometimes. Uh, 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 this is an example. These are the white fathers. People can look for the Paris Blancs. 
the White Fathers, a Jesuit type of organization like the Jesuit Fathers, and they're teaching them Arabic. So here um, uh, they took this photograph, and um, this is in um, 1903. So they're teaching them Arabic how to write it, and um, they're teaching them how to write it and all these other things. And so they went there. So here is um, another picture. Here we can see in these villages, you can see these white fathers who came from France and from Italy and other places called Le Pays Blanc. And they're teaching them Arabic and how to memorize the Quran and how to pray. And they're teaching them the basic meanings of the Quran. These pictures are available because they, they were working there. They had to send photographic evidence back to Paris, to the capital, to the New Jerusalem. You've got here is... Um, you know, a European, he's teaching them Arabic and the Quran. Yeah, can you see it? Mm -hmm. You can see these things. So uh, slowly as these schools grew bigger and bigger, you know, the buildings became bigger, but they're going to tell you there are ancient schools for centuries in these mosques. You can see the people are still on the floor in rags. And then the, the children that they originally taught, let's say um, you teach somebody, he grows up, then he is now a local person. He's going to teach a local person. Like here is another Quranic school. And as you can see, there's um, all types of mixed races there, Indians, whites, and other things, and the people mixed in together. Mm -hmm. And so these were the, the Quranic madrasas. We can't seem to find them before the Europeans arrived. And the people were naked before the Europeans arrived. I'm sorry, um, this is what the evidence shows. People, even to this day, cannot speak Arabic in the entire region. They've learned a few words in schools. When we look at these, um, like the French built mosques and other things, like you could still see the people have got no shoes on. And here is outside a mosque, um, Algeria, you know, in the 19th century, in Sidi Okba, Loasis de Sidi Okba, Okba, however they pronounce it. You could see the people there. And so they're waiting to pray and go in, but you could clearly see that they're wearing these white um, rags. You could see they're uneducated people, and they were given the Quran, they were given the basic meanings before the dictionaries came. So the oral Quran, we seem to find the start of it there. The people don't have no shoes or anything, and they're in extreme poverty that you will see. There's black people, Indian people that they brought, and um, white Europeans and other people, and they're teaching them this language, Arabic, and there's many different dialects there, yes, that slowly um, developed. It's because they brought them from many different places. Does it look like these people uh, um, have been preserving the Quran for centuries? There is another history that many people ran from Europe, yes, from Moscow, to preserve the Quran in Ottoman territories. Yes, the, um, the old world history. And many people ran from Europe to preserve the history in North Africa. That's a totally separate history. But what, it, what is clear is that the French came and um, they opened these schools. Nobody can speak Arabic. And they learn it in schools because the French opened these schools. And they force you um, to learn these um, languages like Jazair, Algeria, has its own language, Algerian Darija. And in different regions, it's basically a different language in some places. Uh, but now it's becoming standardized. Some people call it Berber. You, you, could, you, uh, you could read this. Uh, the first up to the comma. I agree. I agree. Algerian Darija is its own language. Yes, um, uh, it's not Arabic. Nothing to do with Arabic. Yeah, they picked up Arabic words. Yes, and people will call it, It's they will say it's Algerian Arabic. But um, the people who speak this language will say no. And so in Tunisia, if you went there, they've got their own Darija, Tunisian Darija. Yes, or Tunisian Arabic. Yes, but what do they say? You could read this about uh, um, what the people say. Welcome to our guide on Tunisian Arabic, locally known as Darija, Derja, a unique dialect distinct from Standard Arabic. Yes, yeah, Standard Arabic is used for official things. Yeah, so in Tunisia, they have their own local dialect. But within the villages and from north and south, there are differences. It's like because they brought some people came from Europe. Some people came from Egypt. Before Egypt, they came from Yemen. Before that, they came from India. Um, uh, um, and many of them, um, they intermixed. And there was already some natives there that they call Berber and other things. And so we find the same thing even if we go to Libya. Yes, um, you know, Libyan Darija, nobody speaks Arabic. Like, for example, you could read this paragraph. 
For example, Libyan Dar Darija has been marked by Italian words, Tunisian by French and Italian, and the Algerian dialect has mostly been influenced by French. Moroccan Dar Ija, due to its geography and its colonial past, integrates French and Spanish words. Yes, and now they've integrated Arabic words. So what we can see is that uh, many people from Spain actually left what is known as Andalusia. Andalusia, um, they said um, Muslim Spain collapsed in 1492. But it looks like it must have been, you know, in the 19th century. They say it's in 1492 when the Jews were expelled. And um, the thing is this, the Muslims were converted to Christianity, but they're going to say it's like uh, 600 years ago, 550 years ago. But um, the thing is, what we can see is that many of these places in Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, especially in Morocco, were empty. And it looks like the people who left Spain and were expelled from Spain, it, it must have been in the 19th century. Because we could see the people are naked or living in, in like, you know, caves or like in tree huts and things like this, like they've just arrived. It's a little clear. Y yes or no? What would you say? Yes. Yes, I would say so. Yeah. It, yeah, it's clear. Uh, the Moroccans, Algerians, Tunisians, you can see many of them have just arrived and these cities are not there. Of course they've arrived. They've come from somewhere. And so many were brought from India, but that's another long story. And so um, the thing is, okay. So now we can see, let's go back to this again and think clearly. Mm -hmm. Yes, we, let's, let's think clearly. The French set up these Franco-Arab alleged universities, which were not uh, very small schools. They were teaching a bit of French and they were teaching how to practice Islam, how to pray. They were teaching Arabic. That's why they were called Franco-Arabic schools. They opened up all these Quranic madrasas. The teachers came from Europe, Europeans, the Père Blanc, same like the Jesuit fathers and other people. And um, the photographic evidence is there. The people will even tell you things like this. The French built mosques, they opened mosques, and um, Islam spread slowly starting from the 19th century. Even to this day, people can't speak Arabic in, in the entire region. And um, the thing is, um, you know, we mentioned a little about the history of Morocco, Algeria and Tunisia before. And um, yeah, people have left their comments on, on your video, for example. And here is um, somebody from Morocco is saying, I'm from Morocco. All this stuff is real. Me too. Um, uh, another proud Moroccan says. Yes. And um, um, there's other comments um, by Moroccans. People can ask them this. The thousands of Moroccans, millions throughout Europe and America. Here is somebody who says, I can go even further. I re recently had an old memory coming up about some acquaintances joking about a family member of them living in the mountains of Morocco. I remember hearing like 10, 15 years ago, but I'm not sure when it took place, but it must have been from an older date. These acquaintances were telling about a lot of people in the mountains, not even knowing who Muhammad was or Islam. Apparently, someone had an uncle who was not even aware of praying, had never heard of Muhammad. When they found out, they laughed so hard because in their eyes, this was absolutely bizarre. The uncle was asking them questions. Who is this? Who was Muhammad? And, um, you know, people were making fun of, of this uncle and, tea, and they taught him the prayer afterwards. I have even been to Morocco. I've seen this myself in many villages. There's uh, many villages who are on the outside. People don't even know Muhammad or Islam or anything. And many people are saying that the acceleration of the spread of Islam must have happened. This person says, don't know when this happened, maybe in the 70s, 80s. If so, you imagine that the Islamization, at least in Morocco, must indeed have been very recent, like David points out, maximum 150 years ago. So while they were laughing at their uncle, thinking he was an absolute retard, Yes, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, it was actually them who were retards, completely brainwashed, while their uncle is, in fact, testifying about a society without Islam. Yeah, um, you know, so people are leaving these comments and uh, people can check. They can ask um, people in Morocco. That's why I said, go to the mosques and ask them about the oral Quran and the original meanings before the Masons updated the meanings and other things. Like here is somebody else who was saying, so only one generation away in Morocco, you know, in the 1950s, 
where people had tattoos and many other un-Islamic things. And they said, how could this have been possible if Islam has been here, you know, for a thousand years? And they say, something is not adding up. I agree with David. I remember the family of my mother couldn't even pronounce Bismillah right before they started to eat and would always say Bismillah in, instead. Also, it is very known fact in, in the Maghrib, that means Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, that after the French left, after supposedly losing the colonial wars, these Arab governments were put in place and they would oppose the local people, making it forbidden for them to speak their local dialects or languages and have their local names. Uh, basically, they, they now started having Arab names. So these things have only happened in the recently. And this person says, I think it was in that time from the 1950s and onwards that Islamization really started because I'm pretty sure that most women up until the 90s did not wear hijabs. You can also so see this in old, old pictures. I'm not sure which region he's talking about here or district. Women wearing mostly hijabs is a very recent phenomena, which has started in the late 90s. Again, something is not adding up. So the history does not make sense. I mean, the French are opening Islamic schools. The French are opening up Islamic madrasas. Well, what, what do you think is going on here? Seems like kind of a education or re-education. Uh, the Europeans coming in there. Mm -hmm. and, um... do, you think, do you think the Quran, the oral Quran and the Arabic language has been there for centuries? No, no. How long ago would you say it's been there? Probably about 100 years. Yes. Uh, um, yeah, 100, 100 years. It accelerated after the Second World War more as people came to live in the cities, you know, in the 60s, 70s, 80s. It's like a, I actually I actually um, have friends in Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia. Here is a conversation from WhatsApp. And um, here is somebody from Algeria in a village outside Algiers. And um, this is in Arabic. And here is translation. Um, translation, they've got the Quran in Algerian over there. And um, th this is what this this woman says. What does she say? You could read the translation. Yes, uh, my sister says that some women came to her and were talking about the Quran. They memorized the Quran in the mosque. They told her that the Quran that we read at home is completely different from the one that they memorize in the mosque. Yes, many of these past tense, future tense, past participle, verbs, nouns, spellings in, in these manuscripts in different countries are not the same. But then the oral Quran, who set up these, these Islamic schools, madrasas, so that um, these people could learn Arabic and the oral Quran? Who was it? Was it the Chinese, the French, or was it, um, you know, the Africans? Who would you say? The French. Who is it? The French. Yes. In that region, it was the French. So, so um, let's have a look at um, what the French did. You know, they were there for a hundred years in these places. And of course, let's have a look at first. There were small schools, you know, 10, 20 students. Then they built buildings and everything. You, you, you could read this. The first paragraph. French education, given its restricted accessibility and its assimilationist nature, further fragmented the colonized. Students discovered that even their Muslim instructors believed that French values and institutions ensured genuine progress. Colonial, colonial uh, curricula taught Arabic, the sacred language of the Quran, as a foreign language, though there were some important educational initiatives from World War II. By 1954, more than 90% of the colonized were illiterate and only one out of 10 Muslim children attended primary school. Okay, these primary schools were originally madrasas or Quran schools. Some of them didn't even have a building. So we are talking that by 1954, only 10% of the, of the children went to school to learn this Arabic. This is why even today, nobody can speak this Arabic. They still learn it in school. So, and then um, the colonial curricula, because there was many Europeans living in these cities, they taught French to them. And many of the locals wanted to learn French. They are saying, why are we learning this Arabic? So they were being forced to learn this Arabic when they had their local languages, dialects, you know, many words have, are Indian words, Spanish words, French words, and um, Berber words. 
and um, it was being taught as a foreign language, basically, because the locals couldn't speak this Arabic. So they were being taught in these schools. They're being taught Arabic. The French were teaching them Arabic in Morocco, Algeria and Tunisia. This is clear. Yes, of course, uh, m many people will try to deny it. But now let's have a look at these, um, you know, Jesuit fathers or, or the white fathers. I call them Jesuit fathers, but um, they're called the Père Blanc. Here they are in a village. This was a school and they're teaching them, you know, the Quran and they're teaching them Arabic. Yeah, you could see it's a primitive place. So now in the official history, they have to make it nice. So they've modified it. This is a bit long. Yeah, so I will try to read it fast. For example, after World War I, Marshall was instrumental in setting up the Institut de Belles Lettres Arabes, um, basically, um, you know, an Arab, Arabic institute. They established it at Tunis, and this institute taught Arabic, the Quran, and um, basic Islamic law and Islamic history. They were teaching them about the Prophet Muhammad, who he was. They were teaching them how to pray, things like this. Wash your head, your hands and your feet. They're teaching them the A, B, C, D, E, F, G in Arabic. They were teaching them how to memorize the Quran. But So now we're talking from 1927. 51 missionaries of Africa were admitted as students between 1927 and 49. Yeah, this is just one building. Yes, there's many of these places that the Europeans opened up. They were joined in 1932 by Monsieur de Foucault's little brother of J Brothers of Jesus. After the Second World War, two centers were created. IBLA at Tunis remained a center of research and publications. Yes, while the formation program moved to La Manuba. In 1960, the, rec um, the latter was recognized by the Vatican and eventually moved to Rome, becoming the Pontifical Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies. Oh, so... In the end, it was recognized by Daddy himself. Yes, um, you know, Daddy is, um, I don't know if you know your dad by now. Yes, um, but here is Daddy. Do you know this man? Well, uh, I don't know, know him, but it uh, looks like the Pope, Pope Benedict, I think. Yes, it, uh, yeah, it's Dad. It's Daddy. He's saying hello. Say hi. <laughs> yes. Um, so Daddy say hello. So he's now recognized you know, these European Arabic schools. So in 1937, Marshall organized a conference at Bunu in Kabylia, attended by all the mission superiors and the director of IBLA. The conference produced some important conclusions. And this is what they say. The goal of these teachers who are teaching Arabic, who are teaching Muslims how to pray, uh, um, the, the, the Malaikai system, the Malakai system, Maliki system, Islamic theology, and then um, the history, basic history, you know, what they call hadith. Yes. And um, so the goal of the missionaries, educational establishments was not to convert to Christianity, was not proselytism. Yes. So these, um, you know, white fathers are Jesuit fathers, I call them, but they're white fathers. Their job was not to convert people to Christianity. And so what was their job? You could read after I've read out the goal of the missionaries. The goal Second of the missionaries, problem. educational establishments, was not proselytism. The importance of learning Kabili and of studying Islam was stressed, but there should be no haste in promoting individual conversions to Christianity. Um, so the goal of the missionaries, um, these teachers who came from Europe, who were teaching Arabic, Islamic theology, Islamic law and history, how to pray everything in these villages and there throughout Algeria. Their goal was not to convert people to Christianity. And what was important was studying Islam was stressed. That was the purpose. So that's what they told these teachers. Many of these teachers were probably Christians. So, of course, they had to tell them something like, hey, why are you doing this? Yeah. So the teachers, of course, asked Daddy, and um, they asked the French, Daddy, I mean the Pope, they must have asked Daddy, saying, Dad, why are we teaching them this religion called Islam? Aren't we supposed to be Christians? So, so that's what they say. So now the thing is, of course, they've given an invented history, and they're saying there should be no more denigration of Muhammad or demonstration of the falsity of Islam. And, it, and it's saying the aim 
was not primarily to administer baptism, but to save souls. For Marshall, there was no salvific truths from the Bible in Islam, and Muslims, he believed, could be saved through them if they were understood in the light of supernatural faith. So this is just a fake history they've added on. The errors of their religion, blah, blah, blah. They go on, but it says the duty of the missionaries was to educate the people, awaken conscience, consciences, the sense of sin, humility, and conversion of the heart. Yeah, so basically, they were teaching them Islam, you see? And they're mm -hmm. saying, that in short, Muslims would become Christians without knowing it by learning the Quran, memorizing the Quran. So this is the fake history. It, it's In other words, let me just show you an example. It's like there's many young people who go all over the world. Like if you are from America, you could you could see, let's see, Mormon missionaries African. Yeah, so from the Mormon church, what they do is they send, um, you know, missionaries to Africa today. And um, of course, um, uh, many of these people, they go there and their job is not to convert people to Christianity. Some of them have the job to convert to Christianity, but they're going there, they're teaching them English, you see, and then uh, they teach the Bible at the same time or uh, and um, things like this. So, so what they did is, yeah, these young people who volunteer, look at the photograph, two nice gentlemen from America, very decent people, no doubt, and many of them paid their own way. So they found nice people in Europe, and they sent them saying, hey, teach them Arabic and teach them the Quran. So many of these people, they must have known Arabic. And they said, if you go there and you teach them this, they're going to become Christian, which was a clear lie. They lied to these um, young people and um, or, or people who had a nice heart, sent them there so that they can teach them Islam. You see? You mm -hmm, see? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So basically, they were teaching them Arabic, Quran, and they were teaching them the Arabic language, how to pray in Arabic, and all these things. Uh, don't you find this very strange? I do, yeah. Yes. Very strange. And isn't it suspicious? It is. It is suspicious. And, and what they did is, yeah, these people known as the White Fathers, they're like another organization like the Jesuits, yeah, Père Blanc. So you could read this starting from um, after it says the White Fathers. Okay. In 1874, Lavarege took an important step in removing barriers to Muslim reception of the gospel when he found the Société des Missionnaires de Afrique. Society of Missionary of Africa, uh, popularly known as the Peri Blancs or White Fathers, after the white Arab Hussek and woolen scarf they adopted. The White Fathers learned Arabic and embraced many of the customs of the Muslim peoples during whom they served in hopes of easing the way uh, for gospel transmission. Well, basically, they set up an organization. This is one, there was many Society of Missionaries for Africa. So they were called Père Blanc, you know, in the 1870s, they set up and they dressed same like the poor people, not like Arabs, you know, just like white cloths and everything because the people were poor. These people, they spoke Arabic and they behaved like the, the local people. And what they did was they were told, you know, same like the Mormon missionaries, they were told that you're going there and these people will become Christian if you teach them Arabic and if you teach them the Quran. Can you see they were brainwashed? Even mm -hmm. the teachers who went there, you've got to lie to them of what you're doing. But realistically, what's really going on here is that we could see is that the French Empire and the people in power in Europe are spreading Islam. They're teaching people this Quran. They're sending this Arabic language. They're passing this oral Quran. Yes. Yes. And the thing is, you know what they will teach us in history? They're going to say that these Jesuit type of missionaries, yes, these Jesuit fathers are Père Blancs, they will say, uh, have a look at what La Vigerie, what he said, his edict. La Vigerie edict said that Africans... La Vigerie's uh, edict that Africans should not be taught European languages and should be educated in their own languages. Okay, that's what he's saying. But And, and they're trying to say that Arabic is the language of the local people. Can these people speak Arabic? No, they cannot. So they are educating people teaching them Arabic and the Arabic Quran and how to pray and do everything else. Yes. Can you see it? Uh, and, uh, and not only Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, these people went to, but they went to 
Mali, Mauritania, Chad as the, as the mission spread. You know, every five years expansion, they went more south. So um, you, you could read this. The White Fathers learned... The White Fathers learned Arabic. They Peri, Blancs, and Tunisia, and Elegy, and Calabria, Sahara. Yeah, you basically got it. So they started going south. So, for example, this organization, they set up in Tunis. Then they spread to Algeria, then to the mountains, to the Berbers, Kabylie, and all these things in the Atlas region. Then they went further south in the Sahara to, to Mali, Mauritania, and Chad. If anyone checks the geography of these places, you will see uh, these things. And they're saying, we are teaching these people in their own language. How could they have done this when, when what do you call it, when nobody can speak Arabic? You see? So now this Father Marshall. So here you can read this yourself. Yes, um, you could read this about Father Marshall. Yes. Father Marshall was appointed headmaster of the little school in which French and Arabic were taught to Arab children and a few Mozabite ones. Ah, so now they're going to turn and say they were Arabs, but these people don't speak Arabic. So now they're teaching them Arabic and a little French. That's how the French dialect got there. And, you know, the, um, this is just Father Marshall himself. So what we can see when we are seeing that they're teaching these people, they're teaching them in primitive ways. So that's why we can see that they're, um, you know, that's how the French words got into the languages. So they weren't proper schools, as we saw from the photographic evidence. Yes, like here, we could see the White Sisters. They're teaching these people in Arabic. Oh, those sisters who were there, can you see them? Um, let me just enlarge it. Yes, um, the two white European sisters. And then you could see some of the natives are a bit wider, some are darker, some like in, Indians, they interbred with um, African soldiers that the French brought from the south. So these sisters were told, teach them Arabic, teach them the Quran, and they will become Christians. <laughs> but teach them in their own language. Oh, Arabic is their own language. But guess what? These people don't speak Arabic. These people are not Arabs. Arabia was Europia. Europia. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, you, you can see, is this, would you say this is a total scam? Or am I just making it up? No, very much a, a total scam. It's a total scam. You see, and um, the other thing is, for example, let me just show you the history. And um, you will find this um, very shocking. Like, for example, it, um, let me just show from the Uyghur region is is um, in China. So now let's have a look at this, that um, you will be surprised. Um, it's so far away from this side of the world. It's so far away from Europe. So let me just find a map and um, I'm going to show. So it's in Western China, you know, on the borders of Russia and on the borders of Kazakhstan. Yes, and um, there's a group of people there called their Uyghurs and um, uh, uh, many of them look like Russians. In the north, in the south, they look like um, Indians and Pakistan people. So um, this is very important. So now here we have the Uyghur region in China. And so when we look at the official history, what they are going to tell us is some pathetic garbage. This is what they tell us about the Uyghurs. Um, in fact, you could read this yourself. The Church of the East. Church of the East, commonly known as uh, Nestorians reached Central Asia, Mongolia, and China by the 7th century CE. The Turpan texts dating to the 9th and 10th centuries include translations of Christian sacred texts into several languages, including Christian Old Turkic. The tribe of the Horaites was known to be predominantly Christian from the 11th century and to the time of Genghis Khan. Likewise, the Naimen and Ungug Tribes were evangelized from the 11th century. The Uyghur people were later Islamist. Ah, okay. So they're basically saying the Uyghur people and, the, and other people in that region, that they've got ancient texts and they became Christians, and then they became Muslim later. So now the strange thing is nobody can find any Christians in the entire region over there until these Christians mysteriously turned up um, you could read from the second paragraph. Uh, uh, no, I'll, I'll read the first. So they give a list of names of um, European teachers who went to Uyghur areas. Some people call it Uyghuristan or um, 
um, it's in Central Asia. We've got Magnus Back Backlund, Nels Fred Frederick Hodger, Father Hendricks, Joseph Masser, Anna something, Albert, Gustav, Stina, John, Gosta, and all these other people went. And then we've got an Uyghur convert. And these people studied the Uyghur language. Well, they say they studied them. And then they wrote works in the Uyghur language. And then um, they say a Turkish convert to Christianity. They went to China to spread Christianity to the Uyghurs. Now you could read um, the next paragraph. What happened? There were several hundred Uyghur Muslims converted to Christianity by the Swedes. Uh, imprisonment and executions were inflicted upon Uyghur Christians converts. And after refusing to give up his Christian religion and the Uyghur convert, Habil, was executed in 1933, ultimately in 1938. Okay. You basically got the message that there was basically no Christians there until these missionaries arrived. And when we check the evidence, we can see, um, you know, these missionaries because they got funding from colonial empires. So here we have Swedish missionaries who went from India uh, through the East India Company territories and from the principalities. And what do they do? You could read this. Fast forward. Fast forward to the late 19th and early 20th century when Swedish missionaries traveled over the mountains from India to set up schools and medical clinics in the south of East Turkestan, it, as it was known in those days, and began to win the trust and support of many of the community. Ah, so they're going there, they're being charitable and nice. And then they set up these schools. And then these people mysteriously became Christians. So in a, in a similar way, we will find how many people became Christians in many other parts of the world. And in this picture, you can see the Christian missionary with the hat on in the back. and then. Um, uh, other people so and the thing is yes they mysteriously same like other places yeah what type of children were in this school who became christians you could read at the bottom of the picture uyghur children uyghur children living in the yurkpen orphanage they were orphans ah ah so of course if you've got an orphan you could teach them whatever you wish yep you see Yes, yeah, so that's what was really going on. It was the reality. Yes, but of course, they're going to tell us, you know, there was a Christian community for centuries. We found historical documents, manuscripts, this, that, Chinese documents, Turkic documents, and all this to prove the ancient Turkish language and all these other things, the ancient Turkic, Arabic, and all these other things. Now, when we look more, let's go back to Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. In the same way, you know, they spread Islam and these other things. So, of course, they're going to give us a bit of ogress history here. And, the, and um, uh, the early 19th century, a lot of it has got fake history, but they say the Convention of Beaumont had marked the surrender of Algeria's day in 1830 and assured that the French would guarantee the right to Islamic practice in 1830. That's what the documents show. But there is evidence to show these documents are a forgery because we can't seem to find the Quran or the Arabic language or this Arabic alphabet, or the design of anything Arabic there with these people until the French arrived. It was after them. And then it didn't even pick up very well until the 20th century. It's like we've only got a handful of people only at the beginning of the 20th century who had become like, um, you know, who'd got to know this Arabic. It was like the elites and all these other people. And the masonry of this current Arabic alphabet it's not the same as the Arabic that was used in Osmanli Arabic or in Northern Europe. And a lot of it has been Masonically designed and in invented. This is more in my book, 33 Degrees and Secrets of Kabbalah. It's actually shocking what we can see in the symbols. But I'm um, back to the last page. And what we see is that um, the Christian missionaries, many people, many Christians wanted to bring Christianity to these people. But the colonial administrators are saying we are going to respect uh, indigenous languages in their religion. So, and then they're saying we're going to teach them Islam. But the reality is we can't seem to find this Islam there whatsoever, or this Arabic language or anything, and even today. And, the, and um, you could read um, the second paragraph, the French, however. The French, however, also thought to gain control over Islam. The officers of the Buru uh, Arab, uh, or regional administrative bureaus, which informed and advised the colonial administrators 
were given complete authority over all matters touching on Islam. Yes, basically, yes. Um, they are trying to tell us Islam was there before. So was Arabic and all these things. But the reality is the French controlled all the matters, everything to do with Islam, the language, the customs of Islam, of um, how to pray in Islam and everything. That in fact, at the time, yes, and many Algerians, these are videos, people could find them online and uh, many things in Algerian posts, that um, in the middle of the, of the region, Morocco, Algeria and Tunisia, that the French um, um, were spreading a type of pilgrimage for a Kaaba or um, a Mecca over there. And there's even, you know, um, maps from colonial times, which they will say we are older and they will say, hey, there was a um, place there called Medina, Baka or Mecca and um, things like this. Um, um, so you will find this in, in, in the maps and, and um, the, the place was known um, from these maps of Barbaria, but the French basically published these um, uh, maps and other things um, we can see. So and uh, many people have said that um, this history is there. Same like the British on the other side and there's Mecca. And then there was the Russians and the fall of Moscow and the other Kaaba. Yes, um, is more recent. And it looks like there was some type of pilgrimage that um, happened in Russia, for example, in northern Russia, in Volga, Bulgar and in Moscow. And there was pilgrimage um, going on to Istanbul also, which was um, seen as a Jerusalem. And there was some type of pilgrimage by a few people going to a place called Mecca in Arabia. Yes, but um, these things were and um, a pilgrimage somewhere in Algeria. But basically, you know, the current Hajj system, the current Islam and um, all these things and the oral Quran in many of these territories is only up to just 200 years old. And um, we can't seem to find it any older. And we can find European people going there who are teaching them, you know, this Arabic and teaching them Islam. There is the French Quran, things like this. So that's what we can really find. Let me just show about the French Quran. The Fre uh, I, uh, I, I call it the French Quran or the Warsh Quran. It's like um, many people don't know this about the Warsh Quran. But um, let's examine this Warsh Quran and um, compare it to the Cairo Quran. And um, because many people say that the Cairo Quran, yes, um, that was compiled under the British administration by Allah's High University, Lord Cromer selected um, the Chief Mufti of, of Allah's Har, who selected the team and established it, that compiled the 1924 Egypt Quran. And the um, Mufti Abdu was one of the first he selected and then he was replaced. He was selected by Lord Cromer himself. Yes, um, that's a long story. Um, I'll have to go through that some other time, but um, let's go through, let me see, the Tunis Quran. So now when we go through the Tunis Quran and um, the Cairo Quran, let me, yes, in, in the um, Cairo Quran that's there, what we will find in the 1924 manuscripts in the British authorized Quran, because the British were ruling this place, People say, what do they say in this manuscript in the Cairo Quran? The term Quran code, also known as Code 19, refers to the claim that the Quranic text contains a hidden mathematically complex code. Yes, with the number 19, Code 19. Mm -hmm. you, you can see it says also known as Code 19. So yes. now when what many people don't know is that when we look at the Quran that's used in Morocco and Algeria and Tunisia, wait, let, let me just show you um, the Warsh Quran. That also has a 19 code. Yes, what many people don't know. Yes, people will be shocked, shocked, uh, unfortunately. Yes, so um, here is um, the Arabic Quran in, um, that's Warsh, is used in Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia in the French territories, basically. Mm -hmm. So this is used in the French territories. And so many people don't know, and many people are going to say, hey, the Cairo Quran is the one, the Hafs Quran is the one from God. Oh, there's these codes there and everything. But let's have a look at the codes in the um, Warsh Quran. So, for example, they say that the code 19 in the Egypt Cairo Hafs Quran was discovered by Dr. Khalifa. And he made a claim. There are two extra verses in chapter 9, and he said they're false. And he, and he said... Thus, by removing the two verses, he was able to show a code 19 
in this Quran. But mm -hmm. if we apply the same mathematical view or system to the Warsh Quran, then we find that the verse numbers are already perfectly divisible by the number 19 with no amendments required. And mm -hmm. um, you can see that um, it's got 6,327 verses in the Warsh Quran, which is a perfect multiple of 19 and not just a number of 19. What, uh, what is 6,327 divided by 19? What is the result? 333. Three, three, three are basically th 33, 33. Mm -hmm. Now, what is this 19 and this 33? So now the thing is, whoever designed the mathematical layout of this Warsh Quran made sure that it's mathematically coded with the number 19 and with the number 33. And we also find um, the 19 and the number 33 also in the Egyptian Quran. And if anybody understands, the concept of squaring the circle in masonry and um, what is what is the Kabbalah about? Yes, the Kabbalah. Then mm. the thing is, what we have is that 19. It's like the circle when you turn it into a square in masonry. So now in the circle of the flower of life, there's 19. And then when you turn it into a square in three dimensions, it's 33. So what you have in this Warsh Puran is more of a perfect mathematical code which is multiples of 19 and multiples of 33 you see so you will find this perfectly without modifying or deleting any verses in the Warsh Quran but in the Hafs Quran in Cairo that the one that the British organized you have to like uh, make some changes that um, there's some problems with it with the 19 code but there is a part of a 19 code but they're two totally different 19 codes. So now if somebody compares this, um, for example, um, the Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, or the French Quran, French territory Quran, with the Turkish gold Quran, for example, yes, what you will find is that in the Turkish gold Quran, um, is in the job, John Hopkins, is in John Hopkins in America, and it wasn't there. The thing is, um, you know, um, what we find is that you can see here, um, this shows the comparison of the verse counts of the um, Turkish Quran with the Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia Quran. That the verse numberings, they actually match more with the uh, Morocco, the French Quran, the French Wash Quran. And the British Hafs Quran um, do not match the verse numberings with the Turkish Quran or the Quran used in Turkey, which is very suspicious. Wouldn't you say? Yes. And yes. Um, so the thing is, um, people can do the comparisons. Not only this, a lot of the spelling, yes, the spelling, magic spell, a lot of the spelling of the Quran that's in um, the gold Quran actually match the Warsh Quran and not the Cairo Quran. But both of them have this 19 code. But the but the um, French Quran used in Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia has the 19 and the 33rd degree code. So who designed these books? And um, um, the gold Quran, as we pointed out, the first 18 chapters are in John Hopkins University. And after that, after the 19th chapter is in Istanbul, notice the 19. And nobody knows how it went missing. Nobody can explain how it went missing. That is also suspicious it's like for example like the spelling it's like when we look at the spelling of many of the words and things for the manuscripts but the people in the oral quran pronounce it differently for example the warsh warsh uses alazina whereas the hafs uses walazina the gold quran it, the uh, the turkish gold quran was was found to be confirming or equal to to the um you know the french warsh quran which is strange. Mm -hmm. Yes, and um, for example, where even where the verses stop, like people could do a comparison. I'm just giving a basic here. Many people can check this online. People have examined this. Like, for example, you could read this yourself. Total count of verse stops in chapter 9, according to Warsh, is 130 verses, while Hafs records 129 verse stop. The Gold Quran was found to have 130 verse stops in chapter 9, thus confirming Warsh. The difference in the verse counts of chapter 9 in Hafs and Warsh 
occurs in 970, Warsh has a stop after the word Talmud, whereas Hafs has not stopped. Looking at the Gold Quran, we can see that this is exactly where the difference in the count can be found, making it a mat match with Hafs and not merely a coincidence of the count. See scan below. Yes. So what we can see is that the Gold Quran was found to have 130 verse stops in chapter 9, for example, of the Quran, and it confirms the Warsh. So many people have confirmed these things and they found um, that the Warsh Quran was more similar. You see, um, like for, for example, let's have a look at some of these differences in spelling, um, you know, of the, of the Turkish Gold Quran and the French Quran, which is used in Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, the Warsh. Like the Warsh uses Yakul, in 553, whereas Hafs Egypt's British Quran uses Wayakul. The Gold Quran confirms in Turkey, confirms the Warsh Quran in Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia by not having the letter Wow. You see? So the thing is, as we can see, these things um, are very suspicious. And um, the thing is, many people are saying the Cairo Quran is the main one. If it is, why does the Turkish one? confirm with this Morocco, Algerian, Tunisia Quran. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, it's like um, there's many things. But the oral Quran is the same basically everywhere and um, pronunciation differences, but the meanings are the same. It's like pronounce, you could pronounce differently in America or Australia, but you know it's the same word. People are not stupid. But now the suspicious thing is, why are the French teaching people the Quran? Like, for example, now, the Wars uses Yartadz, or Yartadz, in 553, um, you know, um, um, the Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, French Quran, while the British Egyptian Hafs Quran uses Yartad. The Gold Quran, the Turkish Gold Quran, is exactly the same as the Warsh Quran. It has this extra, let's say, D or Dal. So the thing is, many people have checked these things, and you can see these things like, for example, yes, so if the Cairo Quran is the main one, why is it that that's only one country, Cairo, and the British rule that? And then there's, you know, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, whereby the French and the Ottoman Turkish, they were not occupied by the British or the French. Like, for example, one of the difference in verse counts of chapter three in um, the Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Warsh, and the Egyptian Hafs occurs in 3-1. Hafs has a stop after A-L-M, while Warsh does not. The Gold Quran in Turkey, the Turkish Gold Quran confirms the Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Warsh Quran in this regards by not having a stop. Therefore, they cannot confirm this Cairo Quran, which the British endorsed, and it was compiled and um, manufactured under the authority of His Majesty the King. They were in power. So we can see these things. There is some things. As we saw through the list, let's show it again, some things that does confirm the um, Quran, which is in Cairo, but um, the majority seems to confirm, um, the Istanbul Golden Quran seems to confirm the opposite. So you see, um, the Gold Quran does have a mixture to prove that the Hafs manuscript is okay, but it shows that the Warsh Quran is more correct in the written system. Mm. But they both, have this code number 19, which many people didn't know that there is a different code 19 in the Quran in Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia. This French Quran has a different code 19. And then as we can see, yes, um, the way that they've written the verbs in their tenses, whatever, like here, let me enlarge this. And what they've done is um, they translate some things as God to be a he or a we compared to the Cairo Quran and the other one. So, and um, he or we or I and things like this. And as you can see, if you have the oral Quran, you don't have these problems. But in Egypt, he, Quran, for example, here it says he will pay. But the Algeria Tunisia says we will. So he, uh, um, here it says I gave you. This one says we gave you. So the British Cairo Quran says he will admit. In the French Warsh Quran, it says we will admit. Yes, mm -hmm. so the thing is, in, and then when we go further down, you can see many people have examined 
that the translation, the forgeries, you must go from the oral Quran, that it has the we for a God or he punishes or we or, or simply this is a European concept for God is a we. So it switches around from manuscript to manuscript, but simply God is not a he or a we. And then from the oral Quran, many of the original meanings that the Jesuit fathers or the white fathers, many of the original meanings can be found. It's like that's why I told people to go to the mosques and talk to the people and then you will be able to trace the oral Quran. And people can check it themselves and not just say that David made this up himself. Mm -hmm. So people can check this and um, they can go there. Many people can turn around and say, oh, I remember my grandfather's father. He, um, he was being taught by one of these white fathers or Jesuit fathers in Morocco, Algeria and Tunisia. And they learned the Quran from them and they learned Arabic. And even to this day, nobody speaks Arabic in the Middle East. And we find a similar thing. The British opened the Arabic schools in Egypt. They were teaching Arabic, the British, the Europeans, the French, and all these other people. So what do you have to say about this history? Well, I mean, it's uh, a total fabrication as far as I'm concerned and um, a lot of programming. So what do you think now about this oral Quran in Egypt, throughout the Middle East and in uh, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and these other places? Uh, Did I they would say get it is, from their uh, grandfather? No, uh, they, they got it from the Europeans, uh, so far as uh, I can see. Do these local people speak Arabic? No, they do not. Where did they learn Arabic from? The Jesuits, the priests and the nuns that were sent there. The White Fathers, they're mm. similar to the Jesuits. I mm. call them Jesuit Fathers. They're just another organization that mm. was um, you know, accepted by Daddy and his friends. But um, it's strange. It's curious. So the thing is, why were the French teaching these people Arabic? Why were the French teaching them how to pray um, Islamically? Why were the French giving them clothes made in French factories? Why were they paying for all this? Why were they building mosques for people who they could have just used as slaves and peasants? They didn't need to teach them anything. They didn't need to teach them the Arabic alphabet and language or French or anything. They could have just left them there as poor people and everything. Why were many of these cities empty? Why were many people leaving Europe? All of this shows that Islam and the Quran came from Europe. And, there's, and this is France today we're talking about. I spoke about what happened in Egypt um, with the British. That's Britain and the East India Company. Yes, um, next time uh, maybe I will talk about what happened in Indonesia and that region with the Dutch and the spread of Islam. But what we can see is that the oral Quran, Europeans are spreading this. Why? And they falsified the history. They're trying to tell us, ah, we were teaching them the Quran and Arabic so that they can become Christians. Do you believe this history? <laughs> no, not at all. That's what they told us. And they told us that's what they told the teachers. Maybe that's even a lie too. But what is strange is how did the Europeans already know Arabic? How did they know the Quran? Now, what does that tell you? The Quran came from China? Arabic came from China or where? Europe. Europa. Arabic clearly came from Europa. And um, the Quran came from Europa. Now, there's many aspects to this. Many aspects to this. People will have to read my books that um, the evidence shows that this prophet Muhammad actually lived in Europe and there was an original Islam there. And Professor Anatoly Fomenko has spoken about this um, in, in his books and in my books I talk about them and I show that original Islam was in Europe and that the people were destroyed and people can read my books, Jesus Christ. That shows that there was um, many people who had um, many of the concepts that are taught in the Quran were already in Europe and the Arabic language was there or in the book often trains that uh, Arabic was already in Europe in places like Russia, Germany and other places, Poland, France, I um, mean often trains and what they did the same. They enslaved many people, took them to the Americas, Latin America and um, they removed this original Islam. And the Crusades did not happen at all in Europe. The Crusades was between Muslims and the Vatican. Um, and the, the white Europeans were actually Muslims, m many of them. And the Prophet Muhammad came from Europe. Like we did a video on Arabia. Um, you notice the place was naked. 
Yes, mm -hmm. people didn't even know Arabic. 1950, 85% didn't even know the Quran or Arabic or anything. Do you think this Prophet Muhammad came from these people and he lived in a desert where there's nothing there and the people are running around half naked in 1950? Does this no. sound like real history or like a fraud? Fraud. Definitely a fraud. Yeah, it's a fraud. And then, um, you know, in my book, Skulls and Bones, I show... Um, how the Vatican invaded Western Europe and from there went towards the east. Yes, and the history of France has been totally falsified. And we've got lots of skulls and bones in France. And um, if people want to check and the history of Napoleon Bonaparte and why he went to Moscow and everything, the history of Napoleon has been falsified. Something is totally wrong. And then Paris got blown up in 1870. So um, it's like um, the people in power in Paris must have changed around 1870 and mm -hmm. this has got something to do with why the people in power in france have been promoting islam have been spreading this arabic language have been spreading the quran and mm -hmm. the thing is more information is in my books and then if people want to understand the, some of the secrets of the kabbalah and masonry this is a bit more deep and advanced it's going deep if anybody is really interested to see how they invented these alphabets, languages, and other things, and put um, Masonic symbols and signs in them. It's in my book, 33 Degrees and Secrets of the Kabbalah. But um, that's probably it. But as you could see, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia clearly were not Muslim. Yes, um, you know, before the 19th century, and uh, most the majority of the people came from outside, from India and from the black races in Africa and from the white races in Europe. People came and they mixed together. And this is what we ha why we have many different colors there even today. We can see this. And if people are going to ask about what about Islam in Mali, Mauritania, Chad, and, um, you know, Senegal, and, um, you know, all these other places and what's going on. Yes, we'll have to talk about Islam in West Africa next time. But that's shocking too. They've told us Islam has been there for over a thousand years. Ancient manuscripts in Timbuktu and other places. All of that is a forgery too. And the thing is, yes, to the Muslim audience, it's like when I spoke and showed that the forgery of Christian history, yes, um, many evangelists could not accept it. Yes, it was difficult. I know this is going to be difficult for you. But unfortunately, this is actual history. Yes, and it's not thousands of years ago, so you can check it. And so since the, the oral Quran, the original meanings of the oral Quran, yes, are still in the mosques. They updated and modified the dictionaries, invented the fake Arabic history of the so-called Arab empires, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. And these places, many of these cities are empty. They don't even exist. There's no buildings there. They're just empty fields. And so they've invented the dictionaries and there's many Quranists out there who are saying this is what the Quran says. Unfortunately, I'm sorry, these dictionaries are forgeries. They were only made, you know, in the 18th and 19th centuries in Europe. The first batch of dictionaries were made by the Jesuits and their people with the fake classical Arabic. The second batch was made in the early 20th century and updated in the late 19th century called um, um, you know, standard Arabic, which, ga which gave updated meanings to the classical Arabic. And this is what people learn with the 10% difference. Then there is another Arabic. That's another story. Usmani Arabic, which has a lot of the original meanings from Northern Europe. But they give um, the simple meanings of the Quran anyway, which are the oral meanings that the French gave out. And um, people can find this in, in Turkish translations of the Quran. But um, many Quranists don't want to do that because they want to give their meanings to what the Quran are. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, it's a fraud. Yes, these French dictionaries, English dictionaries. Would you trust any of these people using French or English dictionaries to translate the Quran into English and French anymore? No, 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 no not at all. Are they a forgery? Yes, forgery. Yeah, places that were occupied and um, they spread this modern Islam and these things there. Yeah, so that's that. Yes, but unfortunately it's difficult, but that's the history. I'm not on anybody's side. I'm not here to promote or criticize anybody. If you want to believe in something, you do it. This is not 
me saying anything. We can clearly see there's many more photographs. Many people were naked. And you can check um, some of the records of um, the French bringing slaves. They call them forced labor, bringing them from Egypt. And many of those people were brought by the East India Company from India and other Indian colonies throughout the Indian Ocean that the East India Company had. And there was the French sector in the East India Company, the Dutch sector, the British sector, the Spanish sector, the Portuguese sector. They brought them to Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and there were people who were running away to preserve original Islam. And um, the oral Quran from Spain and from France and from Italy. That's a totally different story. Now, um, that story is totally different. But what we are looking at here about the French involvement and the French Quran, which they call the Warsh, and the British Quran, which they call the Haps, because these Qurans were um, compiled, authorized, and published with French machines and printed with French machines or British machines under British authority, which is a fact. And many people are now saying, and um, people are saying, yeah, um, you know, this is what God's saying. It seems like many evangelists, no matter what, are going to say the Bible is the word of God, but the manuscripts came from the Vatican. So now many people are going to be saying this Egyptian Quran is the word of God. Um, the British Hafs Quran or the Swash Quran from Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia is the word of God. But you can see many people are saying the oral Quran that we read in Algeria itself. It's not the same. Many of the words are different. And then um, people in Egypt are saying the oral Quran in the Egyptian mosques are actually different. I've given examples of this in my book, um, 33 Degrees. I actually show where actually in the Egyptian Quran, the words are actually different compared to the oral Quran. But it's suspicious now. Yes, the oral Quran, many people are, are um, asking about the meanings. They were just simple when these you know, white fathers, I call them Jesuit fathers, and these other people in European colonial teachers are teaching them Arabic and the Quran. Of course, uh, they've given the history that they were controlled by the Vatican, but I couldn't find this control. Now, the question is, who were these people? Who was the French Empire, really? Who destroyed Paris in 1870? First, the French invaded Moscow in 1812. Now, when we look at Paris, 1870, and many French cities, we, we can clearly see that um, somebody blew France up. They blew Paris up, that somebody else has taken control of it. And then mysteriously after this, mysteriously after 1870, the French are teaching the Quran. The French are teaching Arabic. Don't you find this really suspicious? Very the suspicious. siege of Paris. Some, like when we see it? We, uh, um, you know, these weapons that they had in 1870, look at the destruction here. Mm -hmm. It's like somebody's blown, totally destroyed this country. Something is wrong. Uh, and um, the thing is, the sky has been modified in many of these pictures. They've done um, put out parts and hid things. But you, you can totally see that, um, you know, France is a total disaster. There mm -hmm. is something wrong that we can't make sense of this history. The thing is, and then mysteriously after this time, it was Ger German principalities. The Ottoman, Ottoman German were, were allies. And after the fall of Moscow, after, um, you know, the French um, invaded Eastern Europe and Moscow. And um, it's so suspicious that Paris got blown up just afterwards. You know, well, uh, um, like 50, 60 years later, that the amount of destruction is just a joke. I don't know how to show it. Um, let me find, there's um, a picture of an aerial view, but I'm, I'm not managing. People will have to find this themselves online because I'm just doing a, a quick search in Wikipedia. But, um, you know, Paris totally destroyed. Uh, I don't know how, how to describe it. There's so many pictures that um, people are going to find. Uh, they call it the Franco-Prussian War, by the way, or, or the German principalities. They came and the history of that sounds like a joke. Also, you know, I don't know what to say. If anybody wants to understand a bit more of the forgery and there is something going on, um, you know, in all these religions and everything, if they read these two books, I've made the Kabbalah and the 33rd degree very simple in these two books. Yeah, you could read um, hundreds of books and maybe you won't figure it out. I've, I've put it in as clear as I can from there if anybody reads them. And by the way, my videos are about my books. So if somebody says David said this and David said that, that doesn't make sense. 
yeah, read all my books. Yes, and if there is other things that they've not understood, I'm I'm still writing more of the books because I haven't finished all the books. Yes, but if you haven't read these books and you're saying, hey, you said this and now you're saying this, it doesn't make sense. It's because, you know, there's more information to come. It's like before you watch this video, you didn't even know that the French opened the mosques, the French um, were teaching them Arabic, uh, and uh, the people didn't even know this. And you do, it's like, it's, it's like um, I've not even shown the proof yet, but I will do later, that they brought Indians to Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, and they interbred. Indians, can you imagine this? It's a, it's same like it's difficult to believe, but it, it's same like they brought English people to Australia. They brought Germans to Australia, Russians to Australia. Many of them were orphans and many of the people, they say convicts. We don't, It doesn't make sense. They brought them and it's so far away. It's di hard to believe, but uh, in reality, it's true. Mm -hmm. Let's leave it at that. Or is there any more questions? No. Nope. I'm good for now. Thank you very much again uh, for this conversation. And uh, I'm always learning from your presentations, David. Thank you again. Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I wish you have a very great day ahead of you. Thank you very much.